Chapter 2 Orientation The city of Sparrow, a massive jungle of steel, glass, and concrete, stretched as far as Noah's eyes could see. The mountains stood on land to the right and left, and faded into the distance where earth, sky, and city became one. What a pair in comparison to the sprawling city beyond. The skyscrapers sparkled under the midday sun and adorned the city like jewels on the crown. It seemed to be locked in a competition to see which could stand the tallest and shine the brightest, creating a striking display of opulence. No, once again, found it difficult to speak. He was lost in an awe inspired silence. The city is called Sparrow, not to fix you, sir. She paused for a moment, waiting until she had everyone's undivided attention. You are from the United States, so to put it in perspective, your biggest states pale in comparison to this city. It is as ancient as man. The Almighty himself laid its foundation by erecting the tallest building, the one found in the heart of the city. She paused and squinted as if she was looking for the building far off in the distance. Unfortunately, it cannot be seen from here, she continued. This mountain that we stood on is referred to as the Wall. It too was handcrafted by the Almighty. The rest were built later by man and, of course, the keepers. It has everything that the people living there could want. And the people are peaceful, kind, and loving. The finest that mankind has to offer. And so, they are rewarded. One such reward is a personal imaginative created space, or PICS. These spaces are specifically designed to be highly customizable in order to satisfy each person's individual needs. She paused for a moment. Any questions so far? Her question was met with silence. At first, the only response was from the whispering of the wind that scraped the hard edge of the mountain and the distant, deep bellows of some nearby flying creatures. You mentioned the keepers, said the girl with whom no was smitten. Who are they? The keepers are in charge of the city, like men. They were created by the Almighty. They were given the important task of safeguarding mankind, you. That 263 said making a sweeping gesture, referring to the group. But they don't act alone. With the help of the council, which is made up of the greatest men and women that Sparrow has to offer, they regulate everything here in the next life, and to a lesser extent, the last life. Are there any more questions? Again, her question was met with silence, so she continued. The keepers, no stop listening for a moment. Something she said didn't sit well with him. And like a tidal wave, the question came. Wait. No one interrupted. What do you mean by last life? In his confusion, the question came out more harshly than he intended. With a sort of fear and induced excitement. Am I? No. Wait. You can't be serious. His eyes flickered at the other's faces seeking some sort of support, but he found none. Some avoided his eyes, staring at the ground as though a sudden urge to count the toes had just come over them. A few looked out over the city, its beauty possibly offering some sort of comfort, but they all knew the answer, even now. You are perceptive now, not to say she replied in a monotonous tone. No, I wasn't sure if she was complimenting him, or if her comment was meant to be sarcastic. But something told him that most were not sarcastic, ever. I am sorry to tell you, she continued. But you are dead. You are here because you died in what we would here call the last life. No hurt her, but was having trouble processing the idea. The logical part of him was saying that this must all be an elaborate dream. How else to explain flying well things, bro? He questioned. 
How can I be dead if I'm clearly still alive? And his body was still alive. His subconscious was doing its job. It held his body upright, kept blood circulating, and consistently fired electrical impulses in business as usual. Could that really be true? I'm not going to say deep in time. But I'm hungry. And I can feel the sun and the wind. So I know I'm really dead. I cannot be dead and still be hungry. Yeah. Wait a minute. That truck. Yes, you are really dead. Not to succeed in surprisingly read his mind. Though more than likely it was written all over his face. But what you consider death in your last life on earth is only part of your dream, only part of your life. This is where life continues for you. This is the next part of the cycle, your afterlife. Unfortunately, it is not all good news, continued Dr. Sisley. No one is sure what news she was considering good. There is a reason why we are up here instead of down there, she said, gesturing to the city. As you can see, some of the celestial guys fly straight into the city. So that's what they call those flying creatures. You should say, solicitors? Solicitors? I would have gone with freaky flying fish things, Bill chuckled. You have not yet earned the privilege of living beyond this wall, Bill continued. The nearest we may get to this city is the threshold of this mountain. We will discuss more of the rules later, as it is unnecessary for you to know them at this moment. And why is that? Interrupted the other with nose infatuation. Why are we not allowed in this city? She sounded annoyed. Well, Lena, not to say she replied, it is in direct response to the way you chose to live in your last life. Your choices and decisions determine if you would end up here in a city or someplace else. People who attain immediate access to the city live a selfless life devoted to helping others. Many have done incredible humanitarian work and even saved lives. You all on the other hand, did not. Not correct. No one answered. No felt ashamed, but at the same time, had to stifle the excitement of learning from Lena's email. Here's Lena, he thought with a grin. Beautiful. So what does that mean? Asked Lena, with a resentful tone. What's the plan for us? I mean, why even bother showing us this city? All of you had the chance to make a very important decision today. We got not 260. According to the rules set by the keepers in the council, you are free to choose your own path. If you choose a city, you must earn your entry as the good people already live in there. The only way to earn your place in the city at this point is to sacrifice some of your free will and serve as a knight of spell. At night, the purpose of life would be to protect the city and all that is good from those with malevolent intent. Choosing the way of knighthood is an act of self-sacrifice. It is the act of relinquishing your freedom and possibly your life for a greater cause. Having said that, you will not be forced to serve. You must do so of your own free will. What happens then if we don't want to be one of these Nice. The words escaped Noah's lips just barely more than a whisper, as if he was ashamed. Then, there is another choice. Reincarnation. Not to say to you, but you will be moved along. Your essence will go back to the starting point once more. You may not remember anything from your last life. Or your body is not. Your essence is technically immortal. You may learn more about that later depending on your choice. Just know that if you choose to stay, the other spell will be your new home until you are granted citizenship in the CEO spell. I will give you a few minutes to consider your options and make your choice. Minutes? No sputtered. What the fudge? Continued quietly. He typically abstained from swearing. He felt that 
Curse words always came out of his mouth wrong. Or perhaps it was just that he didn't feel right saying it. So ever since he could remember, he'd been substituting less vulgar words in their place. Even still, he always tried not to be overheard when he did. The band that we have placed on your wrist should now display your two choices. Not to say sweet ones indeed. When you're all ready, please make your choice. Keep in mind that your decision is final. Well, this is simple, he yeah, said when Sarah first. She was a competitive type. She turned everything into a competition if she could, even when it obviously was not. She couldn't help it. Since childhood, she had been green for a live competition. Match of life. About half of the group had made the choice, but Noah was still pondering. It seemed both simple and complicated at the same time. He hated that there were no shades of gray. He imagined Morpheus was in his way with a riffle of the red and blue pill. That thought amused him. On one hand, the Knights of Sparrow sounded too servile for his liking. At the core, it was pure sugar-coated slavery. It wouldn't be in bright, shining armor, but rather trapped under it. But even the Knights of old had been enslaved for the church they made in their morals. On the other hand, death, kind of. There would be nothing left for them but dust. But it was also a chance to start over. There'd be no more worries, no more pain, but also no more love. His heart tugged violently at the thought of love. He was only 17 when his last life ended. It was so much he hadn't yet experienced. He made his choice. He chose the red pill. One by one, the rest of the group made their choices too. If he chose reincarnation, Please come forward, said Nap 260. Many of the people in the group plodded over hesitantly and formed a loose line in front of her. The fear and uncertainty was clear on their faces. Do not worry, she continued. This will be painless and it will only take a moment. She turned to address Noah and the others who had not chosen reincarnation. Please observe carefully. Until we are in the field, this will be your only true observation of the essence of this ritual. The ritual is the only way to give those who have fallen a second chance at life. Nine to six, we approached the first individual. She extended her right palm and circled her clockwise in front of the girl. Without breaking the floor in a flash, she plunged her arm into the girl's chest as though she was made of water. Then. Like she was participating in some extreme barren fishing. Not to say she pulled her arm out, dragging in a thorough, transparent, winged creature. No watch as the creature stumbled along for a moment, struggling near the air for its first couple of wing beats. Then, with resolution, it gained its balance and flew into the sea of blue above. The blue reflected and danced wildly on its silver coat. And in a moment, the color blended completely as the creature faded into the sky. Another identical creature followed, then another in quick succession. The sky sparkled as more than a dozen of the weird winged creatures flew upward. Not to six feet was releasing the last person's essence by the time Noah's gaze returned from the sky. In a striking convulsion, the boy's body crumbled toward its center as if a black hole was sucking every limb and bone inward. His body was compressed into a beautiful, bright gem the size of a fingernail. He dropped to the floor with a barely audible thing. There was a gem where each person who had chosen the incarnation stood. Not to six weeks collected the gem as Noah stared in disbelief. Then she returned her attention to the now smaller group of just six teenagers. Thank you for choosing to become Knights of Sparrow. Please follow me, she instructed. She made her way to the side of the mountain opposite the city, where a small glass elevator was perched, patiently waiting to return to the ground. 
A small group came on the heels of Nati Sisu and followed her into the yard over there, like a herd of sheep, keeping to the shepherd. In a moment, the elevator eagerly began its lengthy plunge down the side of the wall. Layers upon layers of sediment, compressed into dark and mesmerizing patterns, animated as the elevator slid down the hard face of the mountain, creating an incessantly fluctuating abstract art. The opposite view from the glass door showed street after street interconnected in a circular pattern like one great spider's intricate web. At the center, several large buildings stood, overlooking the entirety of what Spain saw. As the elevator continued downward, the view from the glass doors was slowly becoming level with the king crown below. No one was happy to trade the stale, recycled air of the elevator for the crisp, fresh air outside as he exited with the group. He followed as no 262 led them down a brick path, avoiding the gaze of the few onlookers who took note of them. There were countless rows of white tents made out of some type of rough plastic-like material. No one noticed that each triangular shape was actually made up of two tents standing side by side. These tents featured a limited personal imaginative creative space, Olympics. And this issue continued. The ones included in your tents are a scaled-down version of the regular picks used within the city of Sparrow. Think of them as a sample of what awaits you in the city. Now, a pix is a blank space, much like any other empty room, but a space can be reshaped and expanded to suit the owner's imagination and needs. Their possibilities are nearly limitless. Imagine yourself in a small room, maybe six or eight feet. Now, this is just an example, mind you. But imagine you are the owner of that space. Normally, you would want to decorate, add furniture, paint the walls, and so on. But now, imagine those blank walls pulling themselves apart and expanding beyond the original dimensions just because you wished it. Imagine the color of those walls changing. Perhaps your walls will vanish into a picturesque landscape that you have only dreamed about. She paused as if she was waiting for a response. Unfortunately, she continued, there is a pleasure reserved for only the good citizen of Sparrow. Unlike the pics in Sparrow, yours will be limited to only cosmetic touches and a few basic changes. For example, the dimensions of your tent will always remain the same, and, well, you can find out for yourself. Here we are. She came to a stop in front of the line of tents. You will have an hour to change and rest. Then we will continue on with the orientation. You will find a change of clothes in the small chairs at the foot of the bed. I will not stray far, just in case you have any questions. For now, you are dismissed. No brimming with excitement. Deep inside a tent number 263-2. He found the interior to be simple and spotless. The floor and the walls were practically sterile. An angled wall leaned over the single, wrinkled free bed. There was a large window at the top of the wall which flooded the small room with blinding natural light as it reflected off the rich, sparkling white floating walls. A small red crank design from the door stood out against the empty wall. Not long after the little white door had been shut behind no one, it opened once more, sending a gentle gust of wind to tickle the back of his neck. Um, a saucy feminine voice said, startling no. He turned around to find a girl standing in a narrow doorway. Although she twisted her lips and frowned to show either annoyance or surprise, her face kept its natural beauty. Curly dark hair framed her slim face and brushed against her shoulders and a faint smile was hidden within her thick lips. Hano quickly recognized her as someone from his group, but he kept his mouth shut out of confusion. He always believed it was better to say nothing at all than to say something impulsive and come to regret it. So instead, he just stared at her, watching the light glitter off her spotless caramel complexion. What you doing in my tent? She asked with a thick drawl. Your tent? No reply. 
I can't even do four. What makes you think it's yours? Hey, you you don't have a wrong tip. No reply. The little one shrugged himself. Cool sweat started to build on his forehead and back like condensation in a chilled tin of soda. Um, she said again, more dramatic this time, swaying her head, tossing out her head, and locking her head on her side. She continued. Maybe it's because my name is Hope. The faint smile grew on her face when she saw the embarrassing blush on now painted Noah's cheek. Truth, Noah said under his breath. How embarrassing. He thought as he slid awkwardly past her with a flushed face that grew warmer by the second. He could tell that she was having fun at his expense because she didn't move, even an inch out of his way, making his exit much more awkward than it should have been. Once out of the tent, he glanced back at the markings that he had missed, the small plaque near the door read, Olivia Johnson. The adjoining tent was the winner. He was only a doorway from making a true fool of himself in front of his crush. The thought both terrified and amused him. The muffled, that boy was right, followed by an amused chuckle slipped out from Olivia's tent as Noah made his way down the road to look for his. He trod along towards the next set of tents and found his, a tent label, no Pakai, attached to one for Jackson Lockley. Once inside, he dropped heavily onto his bed, fading into a dreamy state while staring up at the sky to the oversized window. Thoughts of the past and of his future as the night drifted slowly over him, mingling with lazy thoughts about his new little abode. He couldn't help but compare it to his old room, which he fondly called the sweat box. When no opened his eyes, a flat screen television hugged the wall opposite the bed. A couple of posters and a picture of his little sister stood level with the top edge of the television. The picture of his sister shook him, like seeing a ghost of someone from the not so distant past. It was surreal. The image was of the first time he and Maya visited Bombay. He remembered her giving him part of a meat allowance to purchase a sketchbook that he'd wanted. Since then, the act of goodwill had brought them closer together. In the picture, she had a bright smile on her face as she held the sloppy sketch that he made for her. That sketch would later inspire the tattoo on her left shoulder. What was most peculiar about that photo was that, up until now, that image had only lived in his mind. There were no actual incomplete pictures at that moment. It was as if it was pulled straight from the depths of his subconscious mind. His face brightened into a comfortable smile, a smile that he thought only existed in his past, connected to that surreal photograph. As he looked around, he realized that, without being conscious of it, he had decorated his tent. He looked out of half a room to the great threshold from a white trunk at the foot of his bed. Not surprisingly, it all fit like a pair of well-worn gloves. Even the new white tennis shoes felt just right on his feet. Once dressed, he returned to the edge of the bed. More thoughts continued to whirl around his head in the confusing turbulence. He thought about everything that had just happened, about coming to terms with his new life, and about his old life which was now a world that existed only in, in his memories. He also couldn't help but wonder if anyone missed him. He recalled the last few minutes of his last life, but it was with difficulty. Time was funny to him now. He remembered an alarming phone call from his father, who couldn't find his sister, or him for that matter. His father had actually shown up at the graduation celebration. He tried to call Maya, his little sister, was born only a few minutes after him, but she didn't answer her phone. They were both graduating that night, and as usual, neither of them told their father about the event. He had found out, though, and decided to attend. He didn't choose to not invite him out of content, but rather because he knew he wouldn't show up. He never showed up, and neither of them wanted to feel that disappointment again. He had never shown up to a single one of Noah's track meets. Or Maya's volleyball games. He was out of the loop and had been for some time. But now, for the first time, Noah was in the same boat as his father. 
He was clearly at Spud Myers' whereabouts. He had chosen that night to skip town, but Myers should have been at graduation. No target over at the neck of the gray hoodie he was now wearing and pushed the thoughts back into the recess of his mind. There was no thinking about him, the vulnerability that threatened to come out as tears. He couldn't afford to deal with that right now. He didn't want to deal with it.